This is a general surgery class for uh, fourth years part two. Uh, today we will be discussing about uh, mainly urinary retention and bladder trauma. Today we are starting uh, the chapter of the bladder. Bladder trauma uh, occurs in uh, two ways. Usually most of the time it is a blunt injury to the pelvis. Many times pelvic fracture also will be there and uh, bladder can rupture because of the injury in two ways either it is intraperitoneal rupture or extraperitoneal rupture if you take uh, the frequency 80 percent of uh, bladder rupture occurs extraperitoneally and only 20 percent of cases we see intraperitoneal rupture intraperitoneal rupture usually this is a diagram of intraperitoneal rupture. This is the bladder it ruptured and then urine entered the peritoneal cavity. Intraperitoneal rupture usually occurs when the injury occurs when the patient is having full bladder. Uh, sometimes uh, this rupture of injury to the bladder, intraperitoneal in, uh, rupture of the bladder also occurs. Uh, during some of the surgeries. Extraperitoneal rupture that is outside the peritoneal cavity which is the case in most of the bladder injuries. Uh, it also occurs in case of uh, pelvic trauma and uh, extraperitoneal rupture of the bladder is uh, almost similar in presentation with rupture of the membranous erythra. We will be dealing with the rupture of the membranous urethra when we come to the chapter of the urethra. Uh, it is almost managed like that only. And uh, extraperitoneal rupture of the bladder also occurs due to some surgeries. Clinical features usually there will be history of trauma. mostly motor vehicle accidents or in case of uh, intraperitoneal rupture generally a blow to the lower abdomen when the patient is having full bladder can be history. There will be hematuria but it is not profuse. Don't expect, expect profuse hematuria in bladder injury. There will be sudden severe pain in the lower abdomen, uh, especially when the urine enters the peritoneal cavity, there will be syncope, there will be patient will have deep shock, absence of desire to pass, you will not have any desire to pass urine because the bladder itself is ruptured and did not distend. Initially the peritoneum filled with the urine, uh, slowly it gets diluted and the irritation improves and the fluid accumulates. This fluid initially it is sterile, later on uh, there can be bacterial peritonitis will occur. So 
generally these are the clinical features for uh, extraperitoneal rupture also there will be very severe pain but peritoneal cavity is free of fluid fluid accumulation can be extraperitoneal there will, there will be always signs of uh, ecchymosis bleeding underneath the skin around the area of the bladder how do you confirm your diagnosis the best investigation of course is a ct scan which will clearly demarcate whether uh, the bladder injured and uh, there is intraperitoneal leak of urine or extraperitoneal but plain x-ray abdomen itself will can give a lot of information if a fluid leaks into the peritoneum there will be ground glass appearance of the abdomen plain x-ray abdomen will show ground glass appearance pelvis may show fracture sometimes intravenous venogram intravenous pyelogram will show the leak from the bladder but the best investigation to find the leak is retrograde cystography there will be extravasation of radiopic dye into the peritoneal cavity in case of intraperitoneal rupture so this is uh, an x-ray uh, contrast x-ray where there is a leak of uh, this contrast into the peritoneal cavity indicating that there is rupture of the bladder sometimes when there is a minor leak you may have to empty the bladder to see the leak because bladder opacity itself may obscure some of the uh, leak uh, evidence of leak so always it is prudent to take another film when the bladder is emptied uh, to rule out there is bladder rupture or not how do you treat the patients intraperitoneal rupture always has to be repaired surgically there is no other treatment so once you diagnose there is a urine leak into the peritoneal cavity the abdomen has to be opened in the midline lower midline usually and the peritoneal cavity is explored and the bladder fractured area is identified and uh, the edges of the ruptured bladder has to be trimmed and it has to be sutured with 20 absorbable suture it should be sutured in a way it's water tight and uh, peritoneum is cleaned of the irritating urine and uh, a supraopic bladder catheter is brought out from the bladder and also an erythral catheter is passed so both the catheters should be there till the bladder heals this is how uh, intraperitoneal rupture is surgically treated extraperitoneal rupture can be managed conservatively without formal surgical management again bladder has to be drained in most cases put a urethral catheter from below and drain the bladder so that bladder ruptured area heals on its own sometimes when the urine leak extraperitoneal is substantial there is urine collection and uh, sometimes it can even uh, there will be blood also can get infected so that time probably you have to uh, give a nick and drain that area from the skin outside so most 
most uh, of these cases uh, where uh, there is no substantial collection of fluid extra pancreatinally, you can just put a bladder drainage and uh, allow it to heal, allow the bladder to heal. Many times we find hydrogenic injuries, that is during surgery, especially uh, rectal surgery, excision of rectum, uterine excision, uh, that is hysterectomies, any pelvic surgery, sometimes they may cause injury to the bladder. Bladder can be present as a sliding hernia in uh, inguinal hernias also. During that time, if it's not recognized, bladder can be injured. So, whenever such injury is recognized while doing the surgery, the immediate repair has to be undertaken and the, the rent is closed with a 2-0 absorbable suture and bladder can be drained with urethral catheter that will usually heal the bladder wound. But suppose if uh, the bladder inj injury is not recognized while doing the surgery and later it is apparent that bladder is injured, it has to be managed uh, the way I told uh, the rupture of the bladder that occurs in trauma. The same way if it is intraperitoneal you may have to open again the abdomen or extraperitoneal again you put a catheter. Nowadays uh, urological surgery mostly is uh, minimally invasive. They use uh, resectoscopes, cystoscopes and do a lot of uh, interventions in the bladder for many diseases. Sometimes this resectoscope inadvertently damage the bladder wall and can rupture. So if it is recognized immediately the bladder has to be drained with Foley's catheter, so that will heal most of the cases. This is how uh, the bladder injuries are treated. Uh, we will understand the extra peritoneal rupture uh, in detail, in more detail, uh, while we are uh, discussing about the urethra also, because pelvic fractures are uh, one of the commonest causes for extra peritoneal rupture of the membrane urethra, almost like a blood rupture. So now we will come, we came to the an important and common emer emergencies, which is a retention of urine. Acute retention of urine is a very, very painful and the patient demands immediate relief. So we will understand what are the conditions in which acute retention of urine occurs and then how to manage. So you can see in this picture the bladder is distended. This is the lower abdomen. This is head end. A smooth increase elevation in the lower part of the abdomen will clearly give us the indication that bladder is distended. The causes, there are causes which are peculiar to male patients and there are some causes exclusive to female patients and many causes are there for both. In, in the males, bladder outlet obstruction is the commonest cause of acute retention of urine. Usually this occurs in elderly males because of prostatic enlargement and obstructing the urethra, prostatic urethra. That's one of the commonest cause for which there will be acute retention of urine and the patient will come with severe pain. Now another important cause is urethral stricture. Urethral strictures can occur in many ways. Trauma is one of them. Again, urethral stricture will learn in detail while dealing with urethra. So, urethral stricture is another cause. 
acute erythritis and prostatitis itself because of inflammation of the erythra the lumen is occluded and there will be severe pain and there can be retention phimosis phimosis is a condition where the foreskin the prepuce is narrow and there will be a pinhole or sometimes the passes of uh, urine will be obstructed so this is another cause which is a very very rare not very common phimosis obstructing and causing a pain is very rare in the females we have a uh, very commonly retrograded gravid uterus when the uterus is enlarged especially in the third semester I mean, trimester it can obstruct the bladder and can cause acute retention sometimes very rarely bladder neck obstruction also is seen in female in both the sexes we have several reasons for acute retention to occur one is blood clot see hematuria can occur due to so many reasons which are all, we already discussed about this profuse hematuria there can be clots and clot retention i mean uh, clot can obstruct the urethra and cause acute retention urethral calculus see calculi can form in the pelvis of the kidneys and can get uh, distally displaced and uh, while being passed through urethra they can get obstructed most of these urethral calculi get obstructed at the external meatus because that's a narrowest part of the urethra so depending on the size of the urethral calculus it gets stuck up in the urethra and causes obstruction and rupture of the urethra of course uh, can cause retention neurogenic causes injury to the spinal cord uh, in many ways uh, maturation reflex we will be dealing with this a little later in this class growth neurogenic bladder so that is one of the important causes where bladder distension can occur acute acute distension can occur smooth muscle function is associated with aging Because our muscle loses its uh, effectiveness, especially in the older people, and can cause incomplete evacuation and distension. Fecal impaction and anal pain, both these are reflexively because of the pain. Uh, blood distension can occur most of the time. The hemorrhoidectomy, which is uh, post-operative period. when sufficient when analgesia is not given because of the pain there can be acute retention post operative intense post operative analgesic treatment also causes uh, acute retention because patient is not aware of the bladder distension so sometimes he postpones it and then he ends up in acute retention some drugs also notoriously cause bladder distension especially the drugs uh, we use antihistaminic some of the antihistaminics can cause and anticholinergic drugs also will cause urinary retention some drugs used for hypertension also can cause urinary retention anesthesia is another cause for acute retention again this is neurological uh, after some time when the nerves regain their function the bladder becomes normal but during that time post operatively you may have to catheterize the bladder if there is retention because of the spinal anesthesia so these are all the various causes 
of uh, acute retention of the urine. And clinical features, I was mentioning about pain which is very very severe and patient will demand immediate relief. And of course urine will not is not passed for several hours, several hours preceding to the pain. And uh, you can see the distended bladder in the lower abdomen, supra-pupically. And uh, not only it is distended, it is uh, very tender on palpation. And if you percuss, it is dull on percussion. All these will give away that this is a bladder extended with urine. You have to examine the whole of the patient especially neurological examination has to be done if there is any deficit because that will give us an indication of the cause of the obstruction. So neurological uh, examination has to be done. If the perineal sensation is lost and uh, anal reflexes are absent, you can conclude that bladder distension is because of a neurological deficit and that is called uh, cauda equina syndrome. These are the clinical features you have in uh, bladder, I mean, acute retention of urine. How do you manage? How do you treat? Of course, you have to drain the urine. And mostly, we prefer to drain per urethra. You have to go for proper So both these things in detail we will understand because draining the bladder is very essential skills of every medical person. So I will just spend some more time about how to characterize the solution. Usually we use provident idol. Thoroughly scrub the your both the hands and then after washing you wipe with sterile towel. And then take a sponge holding forceps and clean the genitalia with again soap based antiseptic. Usually provident idol we use it. So clean the area of the uh, urethra. In the male and female you have to clean the genitals and then you have to place drapes so that you can isolate the area from the other surrounding areas. So once you clean the genitals, you have to anesthetize the urethra. We use lignica and 2% jelly for anesthetizing the urethra. So this will have a cap like this. You remove this cap and keep this cap which can be used to squeeze the jelly into the external urethral meters. 
Again, this is available in a peelable pouch uh, and sterile. So once uh, the pouch is removed inside the area, including this, will be sterile. You can safely introduce this. This has to be placed here and then squeeze into the urethra. All the jelly can jelly. In the male, you also try to uh, massage the urethra so that it goes uh, all the area of the urethra, right? From the uh, bladder neck to actually erythromatous is completely filled with jalic and jelly. In the female, the urethral size is comparatively uh, less. Uh, once you squeeze it, uh, it enters the hole of the urethra in the female. So after uh, jalic and jelly is introduced into the urethra, you block the external erythromatous so that the jelly stays in the urethra for some time because it has to react and one thing I just want to tell you before you squeeze the xylocaine jelly into the external meters warn the patient that he may have feel a sting a mild sting uh, because of this xylocaine jelly that will be a bit brief because once the erythra is uh, anesthetized there won't be any pain this jelly not only anesthetizes the whole of the urethra but also it uh, relaxes the external sphincter so after local anesthesia you pass on the tip of this is the tip into the introduce this tip into the external meters and gently advance it. Once you uh, once the distal end of the folate enters the bladder, the urine starts flowing from this place. And then you attach the urinary bag for closed drainage here. And try to introduce a little more, even after the starting of the uh, flow of the urine from this. That way, you will ensure that this part is inside the bladder. And inadvertently, you don't uh, inflate it in the urethra, which can cause urethral damage. So, to be on the safe side, you can introduce the whole of the foliage till this part comes to the external urethra, external urethra meters. So once you are sure that it is inside the bladder, you can inflate this bulb by introducing on this channel 30 to 60 ml of sterile water. So once it is inflated, you can just dry it and see it won't come out. So that's how uh, catheterization has to be done. Most of the time, it is a uh, straightforward and there won't be any problem and you will be succeeding. But sometimes there can be difficulties in passing this, especially when the median lobe of the prostate is enlarged. Somewhat it is difficult. Or if there is a urethral structure also, you may not be able to pass this catheter. Uh, you may be able to pass that time a metal catheter, but then that requires a spe special training how to introduce metal catheter. Or if the urologist is available, he can, if it is a structure, he can do some optical urethrotomy passing on the erythroscope and incising the structure. You can dilate it, put it. But otherwise, if you are not able to drain the urine by passing that 
catheter perirethrum. Then you have to pass a suprapubic catheter. Suprapubic catheter can be used if the bladder is completely distended. Without distension of bladder, you don't use this. Only when there is a complete distension of the bladder and it is Clinically, you can make out that the bladder is distended, then only it is possible to pass this suprapubic catheter. There are many uh, proprietary cannula which can be passed suprapubically. They have got different, different mechanisms. Some of them have a built in foliage. Uh, so, what you have to do is again the suprapubic area of the patient where the bladder is distended should be painted with antiseptic and cleaned and draped with sterile towels and just superior to the pubis on the distended bladder uh, in the midline you inject local anesthesia xylocaine or lignocaine <coughs> 2% you make it <coughs> the area anesthetized by introducing local anesthesia and that has to be till the anterior wall of the bladder completely that area has to be anesthetized <coughs> and give a small nick on the number area of the part where you injected local anesthesia and put this trocar and candula, push it into the distended bladder. Once it reaches the bladder, urine starts flowing, then you can remove this. The outer aspect, there is a mechanism where you can remove this and then this foliage which will be attached to this can be uh, inflated, the bulb can be inflated. That is how the suprapubic catheter is placed but suppose if the bladder is not distended or it is not possible to place by this technique a trocaric cannula technique you may have to do a mild open surgery so probably big cystostomy the small incision you can under vision reach the bladder and introduce this and suture it that is how uh, so probably the drainage of the urine is undertaken in some situations. Uh, instead of foliage, uh, if uh, you think that there are a lot of clots and then lumen has to be bigger, you can use another catheter known as Malicot's catheter. This is Malicot's. Malicot's catheter will be like this. The terminal part will be like this fenestrated so this also can be introduced instead of the foliage catheter so you can identify the malicons by these fenestrations the tip this is also self retaining because once you introduce it this will obstruct it will not come out chronic retention of urine is entirely different chronic retention occurs because of the slow accumulation of the urine usually it is not painful but the danger is this chronic retention can cause upper tract dilatation hydronephrosis and then damage the kidney and sometimes they may be uh, coming presenting to you with impaired renal function also chronic retention also causes retention with wall flow so when the bladder completely distends, suddenly the external uh, sphincter of the urethra gives away and there can be overflow. A small amount of urine can be incontinent. So without his control, it will come out. So there can be retention with overflow incontinence in protein chronic retention. And it's a um, condition where you cannot ignore because the kidney can damage if you 
ignore the chronic retention because there is no pain. So once you know uh, uh, the cause of the chronic retention, mostly many times the chronic retention can be damage to the nerves, neuropathic bladder. So you have to advise the patient uh, urinary drainage either by placing uh, urethral catheter continuous drainage or you can uh, train the patient to pass on the catheter himself intermittently about three four times in a day he can just put the catheter himself he or she and then drain the bladder so that's about the chronic retention finally let us know something about the neuropathic bladder itself Injury to the spine will cause abolition of uh, urinary reflex and there can be bladder distension. So immediately after spinal injury, there will be spinal shock. During the spinal shock, the bladder becomes completely a contractile, it will dilate and uh, it is filled with the urine because it will not be drained outside because the retrosar muscle is a contractile and once it distends and the pressure increases there can be retention with overflow incontinence of small quantities of urine and cinnabine so you have to recognize this in every case of spinal injury and initially because this is because of spinal shock the spinal shock can last uh, for a few days to some months also depending on the magnitude of the spinal injury so during that time immediately you have to place a bladder catheter usually for this and drain the urine either continuously or somebody has to drain it intermittently so that bladder will not stand and then uh, because of the back pressure effects uh, there won't be damage to the kidney and also no damage to the grossly distended detrusor muscle and also the stimulation of urine itself will cause uh, infections and cystitis also all these can be prevented by placing a bladder drainage once the spinal Subsides. You have to examine him and to see the level of uh, spinal injury, the dermatomal level of the spinal injury. If suppose there is a complete absence of any somatic sensation and the reflexes below the level of injury, then you can expect that this injury is a permanent injury and then they will never regain the bladder reflex. If there is no uh, anal reflex, uh, you have to examine the perineum and uh, stimulation of the perineal skin will cause contraction of the anal, I mean uh, sphincter. If there is a uh, contraction of the sphincter, that means that anal reflex is preserved, that means the maturation reflex is intact. Nerves are maturation. Nerves uh, dealing with, I mean, autonomic nerves uh, that are responsible for maturation reflex are intact. If the anal reflex is not present, that means on stimulation of the perineum, if the external uh, and internal anal sphincter is not contracted, that is absence of reflex. That means that nuclear maturation reflex also is absent and patient may not be able to regain the control of the bladder. So neurological examination is important to find out uh, the nature of the nerve damage. There are two types of nerve damage occurs. One is if the lesion 
spinal lesion is about T10 level. The bladder reflex will be preserved. But still, patient may not be able to have normal maturation because higher control of the bladder control is gone. Bladder become autonomic. That means it distends. It is when the tetrazole is contracted, but the coordination of the blood uh, maturation reflex is lost. Uh, at this stage, let me tell you. Uh, recapitulate your uh, knowledge about the maturation reflex. So the nerves which supply the bladder, there is autonomic nervous system and somatic. The autonomic nervous system, of course again sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic nerves which arise in the spinal level from uh, T10 to L4 they supply the bladder, both afferent and efferent supply. The afferent supply, that is from the bladder, they supply fibers which transmit sensation of the bladder touch, bladder pain and temperature sensation. So the fibers that arise from the mucosa of the bladder which have uh, sensors for uh, touch, pain and temperature pass through the sympathetic nerves into the spinal sympathetic segments from L1 to I mean, uh, T, uh, T10 to L4 and also from detrusor, the stretch reflexes, the stretch uh, receptors, stretch receptors also pass through the sympathetic nerves. And again, the sympathetic motor is supplied to the bladder neck, where it relaxes the bladder neck. In contrast, the parasympathetic supply is from the sacral cord from S, 2, G and 4 segments. The parasympathetic supply is to the detrusor muscle. So it is uh, uh, the stimulation of the parasympathetic nerves will cause contraction of the detrusor muscle. Apart from this autonomic nervous supply, it is a somatic supply to the emotional sphincter which is striated and which is under our conscious control and it is supplied by pudendal nerves. The external sphincter is present in the males just anterior and distant to the prostate. It is a horseshoe shaped striated muscle and pudendal nerves supply. In the female, the proximal two-thirds of the urethra is surrounded by this U-shaped striated muscle which gives the continents. The main continence depends upon the external sphincter. All these uh, somatic and autonomic nerve supply are integrated with pons and tegmentum where you will have the processing of all the information that is coming from the sensory information and again relay the appropriate motor activity of the uh, maturation reflex which results in uh, continence of uh, our maturation. So whenever there is an opportune time then when we feel uh, urine will be passed under voluntary control because of the coordination of all this is reflex by higher neurons in the pons and tegmentum. So when there are lesions above 10 level that higher uh, neurological control of our maturation reflex will, will be lost and uh, lesions above 10 level will cause a contractile bladder 
Yes, because parasit, parasitic supply is still intact, bladder can contract, but the external sphincter relaxation won't be coordinated by the air center. So there is a tetrusia sphincter dyssynergia. Dis, they are not synergistic. So once the bladder contracts, automatically the external sphincter has to relax to for the passage of the urine. If the bladder is contracting, if the external sphincter is still contracting, only there will be pressure rise in the bladder and maturation will take place. So this synergy occurs in lesions above 10 level. We call it upper motor neuron type bladder. So what you have to do when you find uh, an upper motor neuron type of uh, bladder, you have to again drain the urine with either continuous drainage or ideally they can be intermittently be drained by clean self intermittent catheterization. The patient can be told about how to keep everything clean and then pass the catheter and empty the bladder himself or herself uh, one three to four times in a day. That's how you manage. Uh, sometimes uh, you may also do the external uh, external meters can be incised and then uh, he can be drained continuous condom drainage. That also is an option. But when the lesion is below 10, you will find a lower motor neuron type of uh, bladder activity, which is completely the detrusor is paralyzed and a contract type. Don't contract. Pressure increases in the bladder, and this pressure and stagnation can cause, can cause infection, and then back pressure effects can cause even hydronephrosis and renal damage. So again, this has to be the bladder has to be drained by urethral catheter, either continuously or by uh, intermittent self catheterization. So this is how the neuropathic bladder. Will cause symptoms depending on whether lesions are above T10 level or below T10 level. And the management has to be the way which I told you. So, this is uh, about the urinary incontinence which we have finished. That finishes our class today. Hope the audio is okay. Last time the, I found that the audio is. Uh, very bad. I don't know how many people are able to hear properly.